Okay. Thank you again for joining us tonight. We have Dr. Kyle Swanson and Dr. Jeffrey Orr with us. We're really pleased to tell you more about um, joint hip knee pain that you might experience this summer in particular. We also have some exciting things to talk about with technology. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask, ask them in the um, Q and a box. Most of you have found the chat box. So you can also ask there, but the Q and a box is great. It helps me, um, uh, track your questions and we'll make sure to ask those for you at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the two of you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Jeff Orr. This is uh, Dr. Kyle Swanson. And today we're talking about arthritis in the joints, uh, particularly the hip and the knee. Uh, we'll go over a little bit of what it is, how it can impact your activities, and basically what we have nowadays that we can do to help take care of it. <clears throat> so this is me. Here's Kyle. <laughs> Say hello. I got my glasses. Ah, yeah. All right. So what, what we're really going over today. So the idea of what is joint pain, and I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are aware joint pain is when your joints hurt. But there's several different processes that can cause this and what is causing the joint pain really plays a role in how we manage it, uh, which plays into the treatment options that are available to people when they have joint pain. Um, ultimately, joint replacement surgery is kind of the end of the road, but there's a lot of stops along the way before you get there that we can discuss a little bit as well. And then the big question people typically have going into any surgery, any procedure is, What's the outcome? What can I expect? Where, where are we gonna go from here? All right, we'll certainly have plenty of time for questions at the end. And hopefully we'll have a couple answers for you as well. All right, that's backwards. So, so joints, joints help your body move and pretty much everything you're doing involves your joints, particularly lower extremity joints. It's very hard to ignore if your ankle, knee or hip are bothering you because you use that for locomotion getting around. If your elbow hurts, you can put in a sling, you still get around and not use as much. But if your legs are bothering you, then it really does impact your activities on a fairly significant level. And this is pretty much every aspect of life. So what causes it? So just very briefly, um, inflammatory arthritis or Basically, one is uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is an inflammatory response that isn't necessarily caused by trauma or activity. It's just you have inflammation in the joints. Those of you who have it pretty much will know who you are. And that's something that a lot of the orthopedic world doesn't manage as much. Rheumatology is a big role for that, but we do mention it as a source of joint pain that isn't necessarily mechanical or related to your activities. Osteoarthritis is more in the orthopedic world Osteoarthritis is typically when the joints start to wear down and that's from repetition over time with use. So if you, you move something often enough, it's gonna wear down, it's going to eventually you know, need some sort of help to it. Post-traumatic arthritis is similar to osteoarthritis, but it's sort of sped up. So if you have an injury, broken bone, a bad sprain or something that causes a lot of inflammation into your joint, then that can also chew up some of the joint and sort of exacerbate the wear and tear that's going on there. So typically people who have a significant injury to it that involves a joint will have some wear and tear earlier than expected if, than if they hadn't. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think just to add on that, Jeff, I mean, since, you know, we see a lot of these injuries, you know, and patients up here, obviously skiing, things like that. And I think people need to realize that cartilage is, you know, one of these, um, substances that we, you know, it does not heal. Once you get an injury to cartilage, um, there's nothing that really allows it to heal. And so it starts to, that process of injuring the cartilage is, starts to basically starts the process of arthritis, you know, down the road. It can be, even be a, something as simple as a, a bruise to the cartilage or to the knee or whatever. Um, but uh, that's, that's kind of starts that path for sure. Yeah, cartilage is, is very delicate. It's, it's made to be very durable and slippery, so it slides very well, but it does not have very good properties if it gets injured or if it gets scraped, uh, those, those marks just stay there. So that, that's a very solid point. So non-surgical options. So the biggest thing is, do we need to do surgery or not? Typically when there is joint pain that's from some type of wear and tear, whether it's 
the arthritis or something else. Typically, if we can treat this without doing a surgery, we'll call that a win. So there's a lot of options we have. So anti-inflammatory medication, act, uh, activity modification. If something's bothering you, and you don't have to do something, we typically will try to help or you know, maybe avoid doing that. So one thing for activity modification is a walking aid. So using a cane, using a walker, using crutches, people typically, you may or may not like those options, but they can be helpful. Uh, hiking poles, if you're out in the wilderness and going, getting around, particularly hiking poles before we get down hills will help alleviate a lot of stress on your joints because your joints are trying to control your rate of descent. So they do have to work a bit harder than even going up. So that is something to, to pay attention to. And also with activity modification, you know, trying to avoid hard impact exercises, trying jogging, perhaps not on concrete, but on a softer surface, little things like that where you can try to avoid. Uh, heat and cold therapy. So heat uh, typically works well pre-activity. So warming the joints up. Ice is a good post-activity. Um, modality where you can put some ice on to a swollen knee, swollen ankle, swollen hip, something like that to help sort of calm some of that inflammatory response down. Physical therapy doesn't sound like it would really help people out, and I do get a lot of skepticism when I suggest physical therapy for arthritis in joints, but it can really strengthen the muscles around your joint. It can help the flexibility of your joint. It can help the stability, and oftentimes if you have pain in your joint, it'll change the way you walk. It'll change the way you move your joint, and that can in theory, you're trying to make things hurt less, but it can actually exacerbate the problem. So therapy can really help correct a lot of those, you know, bad habits that we've developed over time. I just, uh, just to add something on that, I think uh, with, you know, a couple of things with physical therapy is that one, a lot of insurances now actually require people to have, you know, uh, formal therapy prior to going undergoing a surgical procedure, especially like knee replacement or hip replacement. Um, the things that they see on that is certainly strengthening up the muscles around the joint um, allows that joint to be, um, you know, take some of the load off that joint with more muscle mass. The other thing that I don't see that's on the, on the slide, um, and maybe they, uh, we might touch on it later is weight loss, you know, is something, you know, that, you know, that can be beneficial as well, um, especially for the knee. Um, every time you walk, uh, you take a step, uh, just walking, you're putting three times your body weight across uh, that knee joint. And so even just a little bit of weight loss can help. Um, and it's tough to lose weight because, you know, when you have, you know, knee pain or hip pain, um, that can be tough to exercise. But that is something that, um, you know, can be beneficial. So those things do work. And they may even talk, may, I guess we might, I don't know if it's on the slide down the road, but injections too are things that uh, you know are out there as well uh, whether it be cortisone shots which is an anti-inflammatory or what we call a hyaluronic acid like synvisc or orthovisc which is the building blocks of cartilage that um, allows for that um, you know trying to basically replace the joint fluid or make it more viscous and then um, and then prp and those type of those type of modalities like stem cells I don't know if yeah. there's something else you want to add on those, but that, those are just my thoughts on that. We may hit them on other slides. I, th I thought the st um, steroid injection was the next thing on there. It looks like we're, it's skipping over that. Steroid injections and the uh, visco injections can be a very helpful modality to include, and that can certainly extend the lifetime of your native joints by months or ye even years. So that is a very useful thing. <clears throat> so oftentimes the big question is, I've tried the therapy, I've tried activity modification, I'm not happy with what I can do. I want to do the more aggressive option, which is for surgery, typically involves a joint replacement. And it's a big time question of when should I do this? What's the right time? Is it too early? Is it too late? So there's a few questions you can always ask, which is one, is your knee holding you back from doing stuff? So yeah, I'd like to go skiing, but my knee's gonna hurt me, so I don't wanna go or a hike, you're not doing it because your knee's gonna bother you, or even just you know, going to the park or going for a small walk. Um, that's a big one that, if that's holding you back, that's a consideration for doing something more aggressive. If you're near, if your joints keep you up at night, that's also a big thing. I hate losing sleep, and I'm sure everyone else hates losing sleep. So if a joint's something that's keeping you up and not letting you get rest, that's sometimes to be more aggressive. 
if it's more than a five out of 10 on a regular consistent basis. So it's typically always hurting, even if you're sort of pushing through, but you're kind of miserable with it. Also a consideration. And then if, you know, walking up and down stairs sort of touches on the, is keeping you do, from doing stuff you need to do. So th those are some basic things I'll tell people. Kyle, any thoughts that you have? No, I, th I think those are all exactly right. I think I think the biggest thing is what people use when it really starts to affect what you like to do, really starting to cut back on your activities. The goal is to keep people as active as long as possible. Uh, and we found that helps on all levels um, in healthcare. Um, so yeah, I, I think those are all perfect. All right, so starting with the total hip replacement. So just real quick hip anatomy. So it really does the ball in a ball in a cup sort of um, comparison. So your femur, the top of the femur, or the head of the femur is the ball, and then the acetabulum is the socket. So that's the ball in the cup idea. And so if you you know you move your hip a few million times during the course of your life, that's going to really wear it down. There's cartilage on both sides of a joint. So there's cartilage in the acetabulum in the cup. And there's cartilage on the femoral head on the ball. And those two glide across each other. So on the left side, you'll see what your hip typically will look like. There's a nice rounded femoral head. There's a nice rounded acetabular cup. They form a line together. So they kind of go hand in hand with each other. And there's good even spacing throughout. That space you see between the, fe the femur and the acetabulum that's your cartilage. You don't see cartilage directly on the x-ray because it's radio loose or it doesn't show up. But you know it's there because that's what spaces the bones apart. On the right, that cartilage has worn away. And this is a little bit of an extreme example. We typically don't see too many people with it this extreme because this really does hurt. But we'll see people prior to having this sort of x-ray. But you can see that the cartilage is gone. The spacing between the femoral head and the acetabulum is gone. And the femoral head doesn't look like a nice round ball anymore. And now it has quite a bit of uh, asymmetry to it. It looks like it's been a little flat. So this is a typical arthritis hip on more advanced side that we'll see, but it illustrates the point that you don't really have a joint that looks like it should move or work as well as you'd expect it to. Yeah. And I think uh, you can stay, you can just keep going. I was just going to say, I think on that with, um, you know, some, it's, it, it is amazing. Some patients, um, you'll get their x-ray and they have severe arthritis like we saw in that example of how you know that's kind of on the extreme end and a lot you know some of these patients are actually still very active and mobile and, and their pain is you know minimal um, whereas you'll see someone that has more what we call early arthritic changes and they may be more symptomatic and so that you know I, I kind of always gets played in it's like well when do you do you know if you just base it on x-rays you know that you know you you, you may be over treating some people, maybe under treating others. Uh, and so I do think it is an individualized thing when you're looking at you know, a patient and I know Jeff uh, agrees on that is it's not really the x-ray. I mean, obviously you gotta have some changes but sometimes patients that have minimal changes have had pain that's been going on for quite some time and have failed conservative treatment. Um, so the x-rays give us some guidance but we still you know, play it by symptoms and um, activities and things that um, uh, are individualized for the patient. And that, that exactly. So that's sort of the idea behind those questions from before is it's the extras will give us an idea of how we think you're going to be feeling, but it can really be surprising. Some people's joints look like they shouldn't even move it and they're doing just fine and right. some will have much less severe, but are in a lot of pain. So that's really based on how you're feeling as a patient really guides what we do. Okay, so the idea for a hip replacement, a total, any type of a total joint replacement means that we're replacing both sides of the joint. So a total hip replacement means we're replacing the acetabulum and replacing the femoral head. If you do a partial or a hemi, where you're only doing a half of a replacement, you're only replacing one side, which in the hip is typically just the femoral head. And that's a different conversation. But for a total hip replacement, you want to recreate the acetabular cup. So we put a shell in there and for the femur, we want to recreate the femoral head. So we put a stem with a ball on the end of that to recreate the head. And you can get an idea right here. And this is a very common procedure. The numbers keep going up. The 300,000, I think it's getting closer to four to five, half a million are done every year at, at this point. Um, 
not as popular as total hips, but very, very popular and, and the numbers keep increasing. So this is what it'll look like on an x-ray. You can see the acetabulum has been replaced with a cup. It looks a little funny because that cup is actually tilted towards the x-ray. So you're not looking at a straight side view of a cup with the cup's a little tilted. And then you can see the stem going into the femur and you can see the outline of the ball that's right creating the femoral head. The head of a replacement is going to be smaller than the native head because it has to fit within the cup that we have to put in there. So it isn't going to match the native femoral head. It'll be slightly smaller. And that's typically what we'll see. I have a little volume issue. I'm just going to make sure there's nothing blocking it. Oh, thank you. Here, here's your basic uh, total hip implants. So you have an acetabular cup that's up on the left there, uh, it's got a nice, what we call a hydroxyapatite coat, and that's what bone will grow into. So when you put this into place, the bone will grow into it over time. When you put it in, it's actually press fit, so it's wedged into the bone, and it'll be very stable from the get-go. So this is, once it's put in, it's stable. And over time, it'll continue to grow into the bone of the acetabulum, or the acetabulum bone will grow into it. There's some holes that you can see there as well. And through those, we can put extra screws to help stabilize it even more if we'd like to. And I standard would put one or two screws in. There's on the bottom there, there's a the stem. And that stem you can see has a little bit of a rough coat as well. That's the same idea as some hydroxyapatite coating that the femur can grow into. So both sides of the hip will grow in to the actual bone. And then since you don't want metal on metal that can scrape and that can cause wear, we have the highly, highly specialized plastic that goes in between and that provides some cushion and spacing to let the, the whole thing glide. And so we'll, we'll talk more about this with um, with the total knee. Kyle, any, anything to add with the hip? No, I think, you know, I, I think biggest thing is, yeah, most of the stuff that we're doing now is mostly press fit. I mean, it obviously depends on bone quality. Sometimes, uh, you know, on the femoral side, the if the person has pretty osteopenic bone or uh, it's not, you know, the, there's concern about the quality of the bone, um, we'll still do bone cement uh, for the stem. Um, you know, I think the only other thing that, you know, I didn't see in that picture was we are doing now what we call um, dual mobility hips, which is a little bit more technical term. I don't know if I'm using my pointer. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but where the ball and the socket are, there's a smaller ball and then a smaller, I think that is, a, I can't tell, I think that might be a regular hip, but it's a smaller ball within a larger ball and both the smaller ball moves within the larger ball and then the larger ball moves inside the acetabulum. And what that's doing is doing a couple of things. It's supposedly supposed to decrease the wear rate on the plastic. And then it's also allows more range of motion and it's more stable to decrease the risk of dislocation. Um, and so I think in younger active patients, we're starting, at least on my hands, I'm starting to do more and more of those. Um, I think, you know, older patient that maybe not as active, I don't think it's quite as necessary, but um, I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I don't know if you're doing those, Jeff, or not, but um, I, I've been pretty happy with them. We, we use them pretty standardly. So the idea behind the dual mobility when, again, you, you go back to this x-ray, you can see that that femoral head is a little bit smaller than the native head. Because it's smaller, it, it can pop out of place more easily. It's a little less stable. So the idea, if you can put a bigger femoral head in, you're going to have more stability, and that dual mobility will let you put in a bigger head. So that has definitely been more the trend. And over time, we've gone from 28 size head to now 36, 38 yeah. size head. So quite a bit more stability with a bigger head into the cup. So onto, onto total knees. Um, same principles apply slightly different um, strategies here. So on the left side, it's a, it's a healthy knee. So lots of cartilage, looks nice and shiny. On the right side, you got the, you know, the red ouchy marks that they put down in there. So that's just indicative. They're just trying to show um, that there's some cartilage wear in those areas. Uh, this, this picture doesn't illustrate things quite as well. Um, highlighting kind of helpful. This is a little bit more uh, indicative of what you're gonna see when you're in the office with an x-ray. On the left, you see a uh, healthy knee. Again, you have good spacing between the tibia below and the femur up above. Uh, you can see that the, the, uh, the bones look nice and round. It's very smooth and 
And again, there, that spacing is very even in that spacing against the cartilage. On the right there, you can see that there's a little bit more lumpy bumpiness in the, in the x-ray. On the inside or on the right side of the knee right there, there isn't any space. So that's what we call bone on bone arthritis right there. And you can also see there's a couple of bone spurs. So this is not always your I, you know, typical picture, but this represents most of the things that you're looking for. Yeah. And, and one thing we'll do in the office is we'll make, we'll get what we call weight, bear, weight bearing films um, because you can be fooled if, um, you know, you have someone take the x-rays when you're lying down, you can actually get a, you know, someone that may have an arthritic knee that's on that right side actually may look more like on the left side, maybe not quite as good, but you'll get fooled that the space is there. But when you do weight bearing films, that space closes down like you see on that right knee. So it is important that we, when, you know, when we order it, we get weight bearing films. And I don't know if there's primary care providers out there that are, uh, you know, that are listening uh, to this talk, but typically it's, you know, if you're going to get x-rays, you try to get in weight bearing if possible, if you can, some places don't have that capability. And there to Kyle's point from before the one pound of uh, body weight you take off takes four pounds off your knees. It, it's three, four, it, there, there's a dozen different studies on these things and they're yeah. always going to be a little variable, but the principle is the same. Every step you take puts weight on your knee. So if you decrease by a pound and that takes three pounds off your knee over the 10,000 steps, everyone's ideally getting every day. That's 30,000 pounds of weight that you've taken off your knee and extend that by a week, a month, a year. That's a lot of a less load that your body has to take. So total knee replacement, here's what your total knee will look like. We have uh, replaced the, the end of the femur. We've replaced the top of the tibia. Those are both metal. And there's uh, polyethylene or very specialized plastic in between the two that hooks onto the tibia and glides over the femur. Let's see, maybe we'll advance. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> there's several type of knee replacements. Uh, again, with, with the hip, it's typically a total hip replacement, unless it's for a fracture, which is not what we're going to talk about today. But for a knee, you can do a total knee replacement, which is the whole femur and the whole tibia, and, typically, and usually the whole patella. You can do a partial knee replacement where you only replace the inside compartment or the medial compartment of the knee or the outside or lateral compartment of the knee. You can also replace the patellofemoral compartment of the knee. And this is also old data, 600,000 knee replacements. It's over a million and a half that are done every year at this point. Yeah. So types of uh, the knee replacements, again, really the idea that we want to leave your knee as alone as much as possible and only replace what needs to be replacing is a, is a big growing trend. So if you only have pain and you only have arthritis on the inside of your knee, just replace the inside of your knee. If it's only on the outside, same idea. If it's only in the kneecap area, same idea. And you can see below the different type of implants that you could have to sort of address the concerns that, that are there. That you always wanna balance this if you only have pain and arthritis on the inside of the knee, but the outside of the knee isn't really looking all that great. And we don't think that you would get at least quite a few years out of a partial replacement. It may make more sense to just do the total, get everything taken away, taken care of, and not worry about will the unaddressed parts progress to more arthritis. Kyle, thoughts about partial versus totals? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if the, I can't remember on the slides if it's gonna get into the specifics, but the, the partial, yeah, I mean, I think partial knees um, and mostly, you know, doing medial compartment replacements, that's the inside part, I think do great. I think the, you know, the candidate is, like you just said, it's someone that, to me on x-rays, they have arthritic in that one compartment and they point to that. I always ask my patients, you know, before I, you know, tell them what I think uh, is where is your pain? If they usually do the one finger point to the inside part of the knee, then I think those are really good candidates. It's the patient that, you know, that on the x-rays they have, you know, you know, arthritis in that one part, but they complain of pain all over the knee. I think that's always a hard decision, but um, I try to go for a partial if I can, um, because the biggest thing with the partial is, is just like Jeff said, you're not taking out everything. And one thing you're not taking out is the ACL. Um, you, you know, you're leaving the ACL alone in a partial knee. And so the patients that get partial knees feel like their knee is like their own knee because that ACL has nerves in there that what we call proprioceptors that make, you know, make you feel like where that knee is in space. So when you do a total knee, you cut the ACL out. And so you lose that feeling. And so rightfully so patients, when they get a total knee, yeah, they do good and they have you know less pain and they're active, 
But one of the things that they always talk about is that my knee doesn't feel like a knee anymore. It feels like a mechanical knee, which in theory, it actually is a mechanical knee. But um, so that's my thoughts on that. I think I think the envelope for partial knees is being pushed more and more. And I think rightfully so. I think that they do great. Um, and converting them for a partial knee to a total knee uh, down the road is not, I mean, there's some technical aspects to it, but it's not too too terribly hard. Yeah, particularly with younger patients where we're trying to do a partial knee replacement, we can pretty much guarantee that you're going to have a conversion to a total knee at some point. And it's simply not as scary as it used to be. It used to be if you had to have any type of a revision knee replacement where they had to do it again, it was kind of viewed as a disaster or a failure. And that's just simply not the case anymore. Uh, we do revision total knee replacements, uh, you know, with, with concern and you and Kyle's right there's a lot of technical aspects to it but you want to make sure you identify those ahead of time and um, make sure that everything's addressed so how, how it looks on the x-rays afterwards the uh the slides on the left that's your partial knee and so you only see it on the inside the outside was kept native bone and you see that there's still good spacing on the outside there on the on the right you can see that that's a total knee replacement this has cement in it and it's the same thing with the hip. You can use press fit components for a total. You can use cemented components for a total. Uh, there's a growing trend in using uh, non-cement or press fit. Same thing with the hip where it's got that uh, coating on for the let the bone grow into it. The partial knees do not have that option for a press fit. It, that's available in Europe and we're still waiting for that to get approved in the United States. So here's what it looks like, nice and shiny. Uh, these are, again, that's a partial knee replacement on the left. That's a total knee replacement on the right. And that's what the press fit component looks like. You can see that roughened uh, surface that's for the bone to grow into again. So the design, so single radius simply means that you can range your knee without putting too much stress on it. And it, there's a lot of different theories on if you want it to be the single radius, if you don't want it to be this way, this works very well. It works um, to get that natural range of motion, which really is important to a lot of people that they can get their leg all the way straight, that they can get quite a bit of flexion into their knee so they can go and do the things that they want to do. And this has been validated again and again, this, this design works very well. So which brings us to the Mako, which is our newest toy at Barton. This is not new to the world. It's been around for quite some time, but it is uh, new to us. So I think it's around 16 years or so that this uh, robot's been in place. You certainly don't want to be the first lemming to jump off the cliff. You don't want to be the last lemming to jump off the cliff. And we're somewhere in the middle with that, where it's still very new technology, particularly in this area. But we're certainly not the guinea pigs using this and trying this out. We both have quite a bit of experience with it outside of Barton. So the idea behind a robot, and I'll go back to the robot itself, is that there's the robot sits on the ground, it has a lever arm, and on the arm there's a saw. And what that saw will do is it basically helps the robot guide you on where you want to make your cuts. And when you have that there, you can make your cuts more accurately. It's the cuts that you plan to do. And you can do things surgery-wise maybe a little bit quicker. You don't have to have quite as much wide exposure because you're using the robot, which you've templated with a CT done prior, prior to surgery, and that helps you guide exactly where you want to go. So you don't have to do quite as much soft tissue dissection, and you can still have very accurate results. So details about the Mako robot. Again, 16 years, they've had a, a lot of systems uh, that, have, that are in effect and around the area, lots of publications, and it's basically shown to be a very safe, very effective design. So how exactly it works? Again, there's a saw that's on a lever arm. What we'll do is we'll get a CT prior to surgery and we'll imprint that into the robot itself. So we have a 3D map of your Sound bite. Is this halftime? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> That was a surprise. Let me see. Okay, so the idea is number one, we get a CT scan 
And um, part one right there, what you're looking at is that someone's knee from the CT scan has been recreated and it's a 3D model. That's the white part. The green is the implants themselves and they, we can size those up and we can size them down. And when we put those on, number one, we're matching the size of the implant to the size of the knee. So smaller knee, smaller implant, larger knee, larger implant. There's, once you have that established, then you can play around with this to really get the kind of cuts and kind of orientation you want. And these each have six degrees of motion. So up, down, left, right, forward, backwards, you can internally rotate, externally rotate, and um, you can fiddle around with these. So you can really get the idea of exactly how you want these to fit. And this is all done before the surgery even starts. So you get your basic idea. And so you pretty much will have 85% of the surgery done before you even make your incision. Once you make your incision, then what we'll do is we'll put sensors. One sensor goes on the femur, one sensor goes on the tibia, and we move those around with each other. Now give us an idea of how lax or how tight the joint is. And we'll modulate how we're going to do our cuts based on how that feels. So if it feels a little bit tighter than we expected, we'll take a little bit more bone to give it more room to wiggle. If it's a very loose joint, then we'll take a little bit less bone to tighten things up a little bit. So once we're in there, then we're going to fine tune and get that last 15% or so of the plan established. Then with the second part, um, the bone removal. So again, that's the saw. You're turning the saw on and off and you're really deciding which cuts, you know, how you want to do it. And once you've cut all the parts of the bone that you need to make a cut, there's five cuts on the femur, there's one cut on the tibia, and there's one cut on the patella or the kneecap, then you're going to put some trial components in and that will let you do a range of motion assessment. So that's three. So once you put your trial components in, then you see, okay, this workout as planned. And prior to using the robot, you will put things in, you'll measure things out. And quite often you have to fine tune your plan where you have to take a little bit more bone here. You have to add a little bit more augment back to here. And so there's a little bit more fiddle factor in this range. It is part three range of motion and assessing how it looks. And with the robot, you typically don't have to go back and fiddle too much because it's already been pre-programmed and you already have a pretty good feel. So that really helps to skip through step three, which can prolong a surgery a little bit longer. So it kind of smooths out that step three part. And once you decide, I like where things are sitting, I like how things feel, I like the motion, I like the stability, then we'll take the trial or the, um, the practice stuff out and we'll open those final components and press fit those or cement those into place. And then we'll check it one last time to make sure everything feels good and then our surgery is pretty much finished. Yeah, I, I think, um, you, know, the, you know, I was initially, you know, robotic uh, surgery has been around for quite some time, you know, in orthopedics. And when it first came, um, the studies were concerning that it was not, you know, what it was hyped up to be. And I think now this is on either on the third or fourth generation now with um, the macoplasty. It, it originally started out with just for partial knees and now it's, you know, it's, it's kind of um, been expanded into total knees and to total hips. And eventually it's gonna also be uh, total shoulders as well. But, it is like, like Dr. Orr was saying, it's, you are basically doing the surgery before you do the surgery. I mean, you have these things mapped out, you can change implants, you can do, can change alignment, you can do things on the computer before you even make a cut. And um, I found, you know, since we started doing it, and I was a little bit skeptical, I was like, well, I always felt like I did a pretty good total knee, um, you know, before this. And what I found is, on the more difficult, you know, deformed knees, it's amazing how accurate those cuts are and how well you can get, you know, the knee balanced and how well, how much motion you can get uh, out of it. And, um, and it doesn't really add much more time. I think now we've both, Jeff and I have done quite a few of them. And I think in my looking at least myself, my times are just about what they were before, um, you know, having done a few of these now. And I, you know, I, if I had to get my knee done now, I would go to somebody that had, that has, that does this. I don't think I would do it old school anymore. No, I, I would agree. I was happy with how they were before. And now it's just that much more dialed in. It, it definitely makes things a little bit slicker, makes things better. And when we talk about the fine adjustments, it yeah. is literally, you can do a millimeter or half a millimeter increase cut or decrease cut. So you're not talking, I'm going to take an extra half an inch here, half an inch there. It's, it's a half a millimeter or a quarter of a, or half a, um, 
a rotational degree. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how precise that thing is. Yeah, there, there's no way you can be that accurate and precise when you're using cutting guides, which is the old school way of doing it. So definitely just the, the fine tuning is just amazing there. So recovery, that's the big question. When can I get back to doing what I want to do? So the idea is that one, uh, we always have people walking the same day as surgery. So whether you have a surgery and you go home that same day, which is a growing trend, or you stay one night in the hospital, we want people to walk with that same day. And typically we're shooting for people to walk within four hours of their surgery. And people feel pretty good doing that. So they're getting up, they're walking around. They certainly, there's a, maybe a little bit of unsteadiness, but people are moving and walking on that joint. And it's not something where like, oh, we're not sure if you can do it yet or not. It's like, nope, people are doing it, people are doing it. And there's really not much concern. Um, we either kick you out of the hospital that same day or we let you stay one night, kick you out the next day uh, and get you home. And once you're at home, people do typically feel a little bit better and a little bit happier dealing with the nurses bugging you at night. You can eat the food you want to eat. You're on your comfy couch, not on a hospital bed. And then the real fun kind of begins where we get you started with therapy. That can either be therapy that comes to you. That's called home therapy for one to two weeks. If you really don't want to get out of the house or have you go to outpatient therapy where you go into the hospital or into a rehab center and participate in therapy for 45 minutes to an hour, a couple of times a week. And that's working on getting that range of motion, uh, making sure that things are calming down, feeling better, that you get more strength, function, balance into that joint and into your leg so that you're moving around the way you want to. And that can be walking with assistance, so a walker or crutches, usually one week, sometimes two, but usually within a week, people are off any assistance. And then it's really just about, you know, getting you more and more comfortable walking. I think, uh, you know, a couple questions that I always get asked, you know, from, from patients, um, they used to use what they called a CPM machine. You know, it's a continuous passive motion machine um, for total knees. Um, and I think nowadays that's pretty much gone away. One, I don't think insurances typically will cover that anymore. Uh, some may, but they've done studies to show that it really doesn't change what your range of motion is going to be long term. Um, they've actually shown that it might actually increase your pain after the surgery initially because of how much motion, you, you know, it's being forced upon it. Um, so I don't typically do CPMs um, anymore. Um, I don't know if you do any, Jeff or not. Um, not standard. I, yeah. And then and another thing is, um, you know, when we're doing these, you know, procedures and yeah, a lot of people that are, you know, don't have any significant medical issues can't go home the same day. That being said, you know, that first 24 hours, a lot of patients are doing pretty good because, you know, you get a block, you know, a, you know, anesthetic block around the knee or the, you know, that, you know, can decrease that pain for that first 24 hours. But then there's a spike afterwards when that block wears off. So you are, we always just got to, you know, a, we always tell our patients, you know, it may feel good when you get home, but over the course of 24 hours, it's going to get increased in pain. So the key is not to get behind on the pain, you know, that at first 24 to 40 hours. So taking the pain medication, even if it's not that painful, just so that you can, uh, when that block wears off, it's not as dramatic. Yeah, that, that's a common um, tip for going, for people going home, especially that first 24 or 48 hours. There's really no award or medal for taking the fewest number of pain pills. So if you're having pain, you certainly want to treat that aggressively. And then I do, I recommend getting the ice machine. You know, there's different types out there, but for knee replacement, um, I think the ice machine works uh, good and that can really definitely help with some of the pain as well. Some insurance will cover it, some will not. Um, but I think if you can uh, get one or you have someone that's had a previous surgery or know someone that has it, I think it's definitely well worth um, well worth the value for it for sure. Yeah, and and this recovery plan I think is a little it's little pretty generic. Yeah, well, it has initial follow up and then it has a one year follow up. We'll typically see people a couple times <laughs> just to make sure things are going okay. So it's not, and I've heard this from people who come from somewhere else where they had a surgery done somewhere else. Like, oh, well, they said don't come back. Like, well, no. If initially, we always want to see you back if you have a concern. You know, it's not a shut door policy where your surgery's over, go away. It's no, no, no. If, if you know, we're in a relationship of a, of a sort right now, if there's an issue going on with you, we always want to know. And we always want to know early so we can address and make you better. It's the pottery barn thing. If you break yeah. it, you buy it. So, um, yeah. 
Uh, in hospital recovery, typically we're zero to one days. Uh, daily activities, it's usually one to two weeks. So it's a little bit quicker than this timeline. Typical recovery, usually I would say three months people are getting around pretty well, four months for more advanced activities, four to six is sort of there. And then a year, it, sometimes it takes up to a year, especially if you have higher expectations, higher activities you wanna do. You know, it, just getting to those higher level activities, that can take quite a bit of time. Yeah, it, you know, I mean, we I always tell patients it's a three to six month recovery, but it, yeah, it's typically, it is a year to get that strength back. And, you know, people think about, you know, I mean, surgery is trauma. So we are going through a trauma um, when you're having surgery uh, with obviously the goal to, oh, in the long run, have less pain and being more active. But muscle atrophy happens very quickly. And uh, it's a one, it's a three to one ratio. So for every month you don't use a muscle, it takes three months of, you know, therapy to get back just to the baseline. So you can imagine when you have surgery, you're not really going out and running and doing the things you were doing before. Um, it takes a while to get to that level. So that muscle strength lags behind and it's usually about a six to 12 month recovery for the strength. So again, uh, you know, it's always, what can I do after a replacement? What can I do? What can I not do? So it used to be, and I remember this from medical school, it used to be the idea that a pint of joint replacement so you can sit, stand, and walk. That's what they said. If you're going to have a joint replacement, you can sit, stand, and walk. And that's simply not the case anymore. So it's because that's not what everyone wants to do. I want to have a knee replacement. I can go golfing. I can go biking. I can go swimming. I can go paddle boarding. And people want to be very active with their knees, and we do encourage that. So there really is very minimal or very few things that you can't do. And that's on this next one with the biggest thing is impact exercises. So the skiing people, you can go ski, you can go ski groomers, you can ski fast, you can ski off piece to an extent. Uh, you should not go in the park. You should not go hard in the bumps. If you want to go between the bumps, that's okay. But if you want to go like you're hitting the Olympics, that that's going to be too much impact on the knee. And the problem with impact on a replacement, any type of replacement, is that it can loosen, it can break. And that's just across the board. The implant that can withstand repetitive, hard impact, it does not exist yet. But some will get very rich once they make it. So <clears throat> skiing is okay. Running, unless you're running from a bear, really should not be doing that. Contact sports, again, outside of being a teenager, really should be avoiding contact sports, which is a half a joke. But um, impact stuff you do want to avoid. Yeah, and I, I've given up trying to tell patients what they can and can't do. I mean, I just give them the caveat that, you know, if you're going to do anything high impact, you're going to wear that, you know, joint out faster than if you didn't. Um, you know, I think skiing, yeah, we, I mean, we, we, we all have patients now that ski and, you know, they, they've gone back to high level skiing. Um, again, yeah, the bumps, obviously, but patients are going to do whatever they want to do. And, and um, just with that, that, you know, understanding the risk of that, I think is important. So. All right. The only thing I didn't see on there, Jeff, that um, didn't talk about, and I've seen a couple of questions asked about is the, is the hip for the makoplasty and, and the makoplasty hip is kind of exactly what the knee as far as um, you know you get a CT scan and gives you a three-dimensional picture of that hip joint and then the robotic arm is really used for what we call reaming the socket so you have your socket and it used to ream it and then it's also used for putting that socket what we call the um, acetabular shell into into the position and there's a there's you know numbers that we're trying to get what we call inclination and inversion and doing it the way prior to the robotic arm was you just almost kind of have it almost like a gestalt just out of experience of how you position your hand when you're putting the cup in. Um, and now with the robotic arm, I mean, you can get that cup in and you can see on the screen, you're looking at a screen, you're watching, it's like watching a video game and you can actually adjust your hand with their arm and it gets it to exactly the position that you wanted it. Um, and it's pretty amazing uh how accurate it is the other thing that it gets that patients especially with hip replacements the biggest one of the biggest complaints is leg length discrepancy um and that's a hard thing to measure intraoperatively at least prior to using this technology but using this now we can put a marker 
on the hip, on the leg, and we can get down to the millimeter of what that leg length is going to be. Now, sometimes we have to keep people a little bit longer than they than their other leg for stability purposes. Um, but we can at least get down to the millimeter of how that leg length should be. So those are the two things I see on for the macoplasty uh, on the hip side um, that I, that's been beneficial for me. Agreed. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the questions we have in our. Yep. So uh, and Dr. Orr, I'm happy to do that too. So if you don't want to have to read through them all, so we've gotten uh, some in the chat box too. Thank you, uh, Natasha. Yeah, no problem. Um, the first question I see is, do you recommend stem cell use using bone marrow for severe arthritis in shoulder with a slight tear in, oh, I, I don't know how to pronounce that, supernitis? Supersponitis. Yes. Okay. And, and this is specific to a patient who's um, 76 years old. So stem cells, one, um, are not covered by insurance, so it's typically an out-of-pocket expense, which can be a factor for some people, maybe not a factor for other people. It's, I'll typically recommend it for people who they've done steroid injections, they've done the hyaluronic injections, they've done the therapy, and nothing else has really worked, but they're not ready for surgery. They, I don't want to do it, whether it's social reasons, economic reasons, they just don't want to do a total knee yet or a total, you know, any joint. And I will, you typically tell people it's about a 50-50 shot. Uh, that's a little bit gestalt and that the literature will sway one way or the other. And it, it's kind of all over the map about some people get great results and, you know, what they define as great results, we, we're not really sure. And some people sort of sour on it a little bit more. It's typically the people who do it think they're, that everyone does it great. But stem cells don't necessarily are not shown that they add more cartilage back. They're not shown that they will increase the cushion. You won't go from three millimeters of space to eight millimeters of space after an injection. So those things are not happening. They do help decrease some of the inflammation. They can help repair some damaged cartilage. But if you have a severely worn down knee, it, it's not a miracle worker type of an injection. Yeah, and you know, and it is expensive. You know, the stem cells just on average is, you know, off the top of my head, I think it's between four and eight thousand dollars, just depending on who and what you're, what they're doing. Um, and it is not covered by insurance. Um, and Jeff's, Jeff's absolutely right. Nothing that we've done so far has shown to grow back cartilage in any significant way that it that would, um, you know, change the course of arthritis. Um, and so, you know, it does decrease inflammation. It is biologically friendly because you are using, you know, basically, you know, your own cells. Um, I mean, we're, but we're not there yet where you inject the knee or the hip and you grow back all new cartilage and your knee looks like it was when you were 25 years old. That's not out there. There are a couple more questions and you might've covered it just now, but um, asking about besides steroid injections and the knee, what other lubricating shots are used for pain relief? Um, oh, go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, I was going to say PRP, um, platelet-rich plasma, has been shown to do well uh, with arthritis. There's been a couple of studies to show that um, versus orthovisc, or I'm sorry, uh, versus the uh, hyaluronic acid uh, in the long term, it might do better. And certainly with steroid injections, it's, it's done better. I mean, steroid shots are we're starting to find out, you know, having done, a, you know, a lot of steroid shots over the, you know, in orthopedics over the last 40, 50 years, steroid shots are great in taking away that acute kind of sharp pain, anti-inflammatory type or inflammatory type of pain, because that's what it is. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's variable how long it lasts. But the one thing you do see in cortisone shots, especially if you get a multiple amount, uh, is that you start to see the cortisone will crystallize out over time and it can actually cause some soft tissue destruction. So it's not really biologically friendly. Um, and so I think it's one of these things that I've kind of gone away. I mean, I'll give a quarter. I mean, if it's bad arthritis and the patient doesn't want surgery, I mean, I, I'll do a couple of, you know, no more than two or three a year for that person because the other thing that you get concerned about is the more they've done studies to look at, the more injections you've had with cortisone, you might be at a higher risk of getting an infection um, when you're doing a surgery. Um, and so I think it's something to show. I think the more biologically friendly stuff like the PRP, the hyaluronic acid, stem cells, to me, long-term over time are, are better. I don't know, is that what's your thoughts on that, Jeff? They, 
they are they they are better over time and so just to you know put that in perspective like kyle said if you're doing two or three a year and we'll typically tell people you know you can do a steroid injections every four months uh we try to do them as little as possible when people are sort of at the last you know i know i need my knee replaced or i need my hip replaced in the next year or so i just don't do it quite yet i want to have one more ski season one more summer you know, we'll cheat a little bit. And if it, you know, you need one, a little booster after a couple months, it's okay. And it's really, there are some Yabos out there who will give injections every two weeks or every two months. And they, you know, people get a lot of steroid injections very quickly when you have that type of a treatment model, which is really something we don't want to do. So if you're getting them every every four months or so for a couple of years, that's fine. Especially for younger patients where we were trying to get you uh, quite a few more years switching over to those ortho visc or the hyaluronic acid, or even talking about that PRP stem cells, which can be pricey. That is sometimes a better option for that long-term management. Another thing with cortisone, just, you know, cause patients will come in and go, Hey, just, I want to get my quarter. I want to get a cortisone shot and then get my knee done in a couple months. Um, is you, the recommendation is not to do a cortisone shot if you're going to have surgery within three months of that joint, um, whether it's a hip or knee. And I usually even try to go a little bit further out than that, um, just because, you know, you, you just worry about the risk of infection. So, you know, that's that's my feeling on that. So, yeah, agreed. At least three months. Yeah. Okay. There are a couple questions about um, is Mako for hips. Um, also asking about best hip implant. Um, and then for hip replacement, do you um, recommend anterior or exterior or other? Um, well, yeah, Mako is for the hip and the kind of like we briefly touched on, um, it's for helping us position, putting the cup in the proper orientation. And then um, also with helping with leg lengths, um, uh, when we're in surgery. Um, so I've found it, I've found it valuable so far using it for hip replacements for sure. Um, and, um, I think, um, you know, I, I think that the other thing that it does too, is, you know, in surgery now, I, I used to, when I did total hips, after you get your implants in or even your trials in, you take an x-ray to see and make sure you like the position of everything before you put the actual implants in. And now I don't use x-rays. So you do have that decreased risk of radiation. I mean, not that an x-ray is a lot of radiation, but um, you know, you're there with in real time looking at the implants on the computer screen and showing you exactly where it is in real space, real time. And I, that, I think that feedback has, has been great. Yeah. The um, answer is it's absolutely used for uh, hips, yes. It, it is used for hips. And as far as hip approaches, there's anterior, there's the posterior, and there's a few different um, anterior lateral, there's a few approaches in between. There, there's not a significant difference between the different approaches. There's the, you know, with the anterior approach or certain approaches, you don't cut through muscles. The muscles that are cut through a posterior approach are very small muscles, not your big gluteal muscles that, you know, really abduct the, the leg. It's, it's is what we call short external rotators. They're fairly small muscles that do, do get repaired after surgery. The anterior approach does allow you to sort of navigate between the muscles a little bit more so you're not cutting muscles. There is a large artery that you are taking down that, again, it, it's long-term, you know, these little things that you violate to get to where you need to go don't make a big difference. If they did, then those approaches would be utilized. So posterior and anterior are both very common. They're both very popular. Kyle and I both use a posterior approach and, you know, the outcomes, particularly the long-term outcomes are the same and equivalent. Yeah. I mean, I trained doing posterior approach and then I actually did go and do an anterior hip approach course and I actually did do a few anterior hips and I didn't notice any difference as far as outcomes went when I did, you know, maybe if I did more, maybe I would have seen a difference, but I didn't notice any difference. And I, you have to take that when it says muscle sparing, you have to take that as a caveat because you actually are, their muscle is getting damaged when you're going in through the front. And then there's also um, a nerve in the front that will sometimes get injured when you're doing an anterior hip that is a sensory nerve to the front of the thigh and that can get injured. And on some studies, it gets injured about 20, 25% of the time. And so people can have some numbness, some, you know, 
anterior leg pain, things like that. So that was the other reason why I kind of went back to the posterior. The anterior approach came out because of the risk of dislocation with the posterior approach. But now that with newer technology, getting the accurate position of implants, hip dislocation, even with the posterior approach is extremely rare. Um, I think I've done probably close to a thousand hips now since I've been here and I've only had one dislocation, knock on wood, but um, so that risk of it is pretty, pretty, pretty rare. Um, and that was the reason why the anterior approach came back because you saved the posterior hip capsule when you did an anterior approach. I'm gonna combine um, two questions, both on knee. Um, what level of knee pain would indicate a knee replacement? And then what is the plan for both knees needing total replacement? What is the best approach for someone in their late sixties, but still um, actively skiing and biking? Go ahead, Jeff, you take that one. Okay, so the, the common things that I'll tell people, this got mentioned a little bit earlier, but the idea, that I'll just ask three questions. One is your joint, any joint knee, uh, keeping from doing what you wanna do. So if you don't go hiking because your knee's gonna hurt, you don't play with grandkids because your knee's gonna hurt, you don't, you, know, you don't enjoy the sunshine because your knee's gonna hurt, that's a problem. If you're not getting sleep at night because your joints keep you up, like you're tossing turning, you can't get comfortable, you need to put a pillow under it, you need to put ice on top of it, you know, you just can't find that comfortable position. That's a problem. I hate losing sleep. I, you know, I think that that's an issue. And then three, if it's typically more than a five out of 10 pain, that's also a concern where, okay, you're just in pain all the time. So that's also a problem. Especially if you've tried therapy, you've tried injection, you've tried ignoring it, you've tried, you know, all the things short of surgery to make it better. And it's just not making you happy. It's just not working. Then that's a time for a serious look at possibly a joint replacement. And the way I sort of see my role in this is kind of like a bowling lane where I'm just the bumpers on the sides. I just keep you from making bad decisions. So if you say have bad knee pain, but your x-rays look perfectly fine and you've had pain for a week, maybe a knee replacement's a little too aggressive to jump into. And we, not that you're not having pain and it's not valid that something hurts, but we should maybe look a little bit more into what's really causing your pain. So our job is to help you make good decisions based on the information that we that you give us. So that, that's sort of the talk right there. And um, as far as bilateral knee replacements, that certainly is an option. Some people want to do that. You do have more pain with a bilateral knee replacement than just a straightforward knee replacement. It's one of those few instances in life where one plus one does not equal two. It's typically, it's not twice the pain. It's typically more, it can be three times as much pain because you just don't have one good leg to stand on. And so <clears throat> we will try to take a little bit more of a aggressive approach with pain management and give a little bit of additional pain medication to help sort of ease that transition. But it is a little bit of a trade-off where you're only going through the procedure once you get both knees done, but you are going to be more uncomfortable for a, a little bit of a longer period of time. Yeah. And I think you, I mean, I'm pretty selective on doing bilaterals. I mean, I do them, um, but I don't do them all the time. Um, and yeah, I tell the patient exactly that it's, you know, the pain initially is pretty significant. You don't, you don't have a good leg to stand on. The other thing is, you know, it is a higher, there is a higher risk of complications with bilateral knee replacements. The biggest risk is a higher risk of getting a blood clot. Um, you know, that's, you know, that's been shown. So I would typically, if I do that, normally if someone doesn't have any high risk factors uh, for blood clot after surgery, I'll put them on aspirin for two weeks. Um, if they're at a higher risk, which I would consider bilateral knee replacements higher risk, I would put them on, on something a little bit more aggressive for anticoagulation just to decrease that risk of blood clot. There is a question about cross country skiing. So I don't know if that's a better activity or that goes back into the realm of all activities. I guess it depends on what kind of cross country skiing. If it's like traditional, I think that's fine. I mean, I don't think there's any issues. I think skate skiing might be a little difficult with a knee replacement. Uh, maybe not so much with a hip replacement, but a knee replacement, it might be, I don't know. Yeah. No, cross country is a great idea, especially, you know, low, low impact. Um, just funny caveat, when my wife was pregnant with our last kid, she went from downhill skiing to cross country skiing just to avoid falls and impacts. And when we were cross country skiing one time, it was just really slick. It's just falling twice just straight on her tummy. So it, there can be, it's not completely benign activity. So uh, take with a grain of salt, but typically yes, cross country is a good thing to do. 
Okay, and I think I'll wrap it up with a last question. I, there's um, some questions about where is Mako available? Is it just up here in Tahoe? Um, and then do you offer um, surgeries down in Carson? Um, it's, yeah, the, the, there's, there's certainly, it's, it's available in, in a lot of different areas. Uh, you know, they have it in this, they obviously have them in the Sacramento area. Reno has it. Carson does not have it. Uh, and uh, Minden Gardnerville does do not have it. Um, as far as surgery down in the Valley, um, I do do surgery at Carson Valley Medical Center. They don't have the makoplasty there. Uh, I think they'll get one eventually, but they don't have it yet. So that, that's something to, to think about. And, you know, I have been, having done, you know, doing the, we've been doing this now for the, I, I don't know, four or five months with the makeoplasty. I can't remember when we started, but I am starting to do more and more of my total joints, you know, pushing them more up in this direction, just because I feel like it is a better, I think the outcome is better. Um, I, I mean, we still can do traditional total hips and total knees and they do fine, but I think that, I think in the standard of care in five years to 10 years from now, probably five, uh, it's gonna be robotic. Um, it's gonna be robotics for sure. Great. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Sorry, any closing thoughts? Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Closing thoughts. It's, uh, you know, I'll typically tell people every joint in the room that we're in is going to get replaced at some point. It, it's, it's a matter of time, it's a matter of when, but that's the end stage. And at, at some point, whether people get there quickly or get there slowly, our job is to, you know, kind of, like I was saying before, keep you from making bad decisions. So you, we always try to come up with a non-surgical approach first, see if we can keep your knees or keep your hips working as long as we can. But we do know the end stage and, at some point, you know, we do have those options to take care of that with surgery when we get to that point. And some people, yeah, we'll treat them for years and years and they do just fine. Some people will treat them for six months and it's okay, well, here's where we are. So it, it's about knowing what your options are, knowing what we can and can't do, having reasonable expectations. And our job is always to keep you doing what you want to do as best we can. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, um... I think our role is, you know, to basically try to, you know, keep you keep people doing the things that they like to do um, for as long as possible. And, you know, eventually sometimes it's surgery that gets you there, but there's a lot of things that can be done prior to that. Um, and I think everybody is different. So everybody's comfort level as far as surgery um, with regards to patients, you know, their comfort level is different. Some people just want to get it done and right away so they can get back to doing things. Some people want to go as long as they can without surgery. And so that's, you know, that's, you know, and that's fine. Great. Well, thank you both so much. I did want to point out that um, I included the link to the total joint uh, replacement program that Madonna Doyle runs. You can click on the link there and it will take you to the, uh, the booklet. So please be sure to check that out. She's available for questions. Um, and then for those of you who are asking, this was recorded, so it will be available on our YouTube page, um, as well as on our Facebook page, um, shortly after, and there is going to be a short survey following the conclusion of this webinar. We love hearing your feedback and, um, would love to know if you have any future topics you want to hear. And I'll just say to both of you that there's been lots of nice kudos and, um, compliments about either experiences with you both or appreciating the information tonight. So thank you so much. I hope you both have a wonderful rest of your evening and thanks to the community for joining tonight. Yeah. Thank you, Natasha. Thank, thank you, Natasha. Natasha. Thank you, everyone.